Well, it's wonderful to worship again with you this morning and to see some of our members coming back, knowing that others will be traveling shortly, and we uphold them in prayer. And uh, so thankful that we can worship our great God together. He is indeed beyond all praising, as we sung this morning. And uh, we are thankful now to hear from him uh, through the ministry of the word. So I would uh, follow what uh, Brother Ken has said, that if you are away, and I know some of you have this habit, then do uh, check in with the YouTube uh, channel to follow the series. And if you have been away, then uh, that's a wonderful way to catch up with uh, what we're doing so that you can see the continuity and the flow of what Luke has written here. So we come back to uh, features of a faithful church and how many of them there are in Acts chapter 11, now Acts chapter 13. We come for the seventh sermon in the series to a faithful church is a missional church, looking at the second half of verse 2 through verse 4. And again, I would commend to you the practice of uh, following in the Bible because this is the only authority I have to speak to you. And it's important for you as the Christians of Berea in Acts 17 to check the scriptures as to what I say is true. And so we left off last week with the prophets and the teachers leading the church in worship and fasting. And now we transition from the second half of verse, uh, first half of verse 2 through to the second half of verse 2 and following. But I begin with two words. Um, first of all, a word about worship. Obviously, uh, that's the word that's used here by Luke. It's uh, the word in Greek from which we get the English word liturgy which has over the centuries come to refer to set forms of worship. They were worshiping together. We are told that they worship, but we're not told how they worshiped. And so a few principles drawn from the wider scope of scriptures so that we can know something of God's will for what we do when we gather together. First of all, I want to see, say that their worship was regulated by God. It follows that if God is God, and has called us to worship, then we don't worship anyhow we want to worship. We worship as directed by his word in the way in which we should worship. God has always directed his people not only that we are to worship, and in this new covenant era to gather together on the first day of the week in remembrance of the fact that Jesus is alive, but he also has things to say about how we worship, and that's uh, demonstrated to us very plainly by the meticulous detail given to us about the construction of the tabernacle. It was a moving tent, but it was a tent designed by God with meaning so that God's people could worship in accordance with the will of God. And then as the history of redemption unfolds, the idea of the presence of God is not captured by a moving tent, but by a solid temple. And now, of course, in this new covenant era, we worship through Christ. So the second principle I'd say to you is that their worship reflected how much of the gospel had been revealed. So the tabernacle and the temple were depictions of God's presence, but Christ came to actually embody the presence of God amongst his people. That is why he's called Emmanuel, God with us. That is why we read in John 114, that the word became flesh and dwelt, literally, tabernacled amongst us, the fulfillment of what the tabernacle was designed to do. So moreover, not only uh, does our worship reflect the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We no longer bring our pigeons or turtle doves, we no longer bring our sheep or our goats or bulls according to our economic standing, because we have Christ, who is the actual lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And that comports with what Luke has already told us, that they were worshiping the Lord. Not simply the covenant Lord that we now know to be the triune God, but specifically they were worshiping through the Lord Jesus Christ. Another principle I'd like to bring to your attention is that worship contains abiding elements. This could take a whole sermon, so let me just say that we have certain elements of public worship because they are identifiable, not only in the Old Testament, but also brought into the New Testament, such as praise, such as prayer, such as scripture reading and preaching, such as tithes and offerings and the sacraments. Notice then in that uh, 
litany of elements of worship that the, wor the, uh, the music that we use, the sung praise that we use, is in service to the Word of God. It is the Word of God which is supreme from the beginning to the end of worship, but climactically, as we prepare to hear from God through the ministry of the Word. It is specifically in this portion of the service that we hear from God. So let me say uh, this morning with regard to music and worship, a few comments, just a few comments. But I want to make these comments because I believe that balance is so critical to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I believe one of the reasons we have tension sometimes over worship and specifically the role in worship is because we have a tendency to lose balance either in a traditional direction or a contemporary direction. I said to one of the uh, fellowship groups the other night, well, um, God has given me some perhaps controversial things to say here, so I'm going to spit them all out while I don't know you very well, so nobody can say he's getting at me. Okay? So let me speak to you about uh, traditional worship, specifically the use of the organ. It's a marvelous instrument. But it is not to be an idol. There is only one possible place, to my knowledge, where anything resembling the organ is found in the scriptures, and that's reference to the pipes in Psalm 150. And there it's mentioned amid a whole array of instruments. And then I discovered when I was doing my doctoral studies in the University of Edinburgh that when you go to the 19th century, you find so many tracts and treatises produced called the organ question. Why were they written? Because up until that point in time, they'd all been singing psalms unaccompanied, and by the 19th century, the organ came in as the instrument of contemporary worship. I think it's important to understand that, because you do not find this idea in the scriptures when it comes to the worship of God, that the organ is the only legitimate instrument whereby we worship God. So to be even-handed, let me come to the issue of contemporary worship. And I think it's important to say that the instruments we use are to be guarded in the same way as the organ is to be guarded. That the instruments we use are not a supplanting of the singing out of praise for God's glory. The organ is merely a support to the singing of the people of God, and so are the drums. And it is important for us to say, especially with uh, sad news coming out the Hillsong movement, that if we believe that only contemporary worship is live worship, it's important to revise our opinion. Because we are finding that it is very possible for people to be all gung-ho for contemporary worship, but it's really a carnal pursuit. Instead of going to the nightclub, we go to public worship. That is not what contemporary worship is for. Contemporary worship is for the support of the singing of God's people. And one of the most detrimental aspects of contemporary worship is that people in the congregation of Lot have given off singing because the professionals do the singing. No, no. Our song leaders, and we praise God for them and for all their dedication, are there so that we as the people of God may be led in singing so that we might sing out to the praise of God. Have you ever wondered why the ceiling is so high? It is to help the acoustics for the singing of God's people. So we don't look at our song leaders and say, well, they are the experts of singing. So I just don't sing. I just listen to them as if I'm at some concert. No, they lead us in singing so that we may be led. And so my pitch to you this morning, and again, I'm only going to touch on these uh, uh, interesting themes when they can see, be seen to arise from the scripture at hand. How are they worshiping? We're not told. But what we know is this, that the style of music was not very important. What was important is that they came with pure hearts, Hearts engaged to glorify and praise God and hearts and minds listening out to hear from God. 
And it is for that reason, as we contemplate going back to two services, not to prejudge the decision of the eldership and the outworking by the worship committee, that we need perhaps, if we're on the traditional side of things or the contemporary side of things, to bring our views towards the middle more, to ensure that our preference for instruments is based on biblical principle and does not become an idol. A word then secondly by way of introduction about Revelation. As they worshipped and fasted, says Luke, the Holy Spirit said. Now, there are two things going on there. First of all, a subtle reference to the fact, and we've mentioned this before, that the Holy Spirit is not simply a force. He's very powerful. But he's not some abstract force like the wind. He's more powerful than the wind, but he's more personal than the wind. How is uh, that possible? Well, he speaks. The wind doesn't speak. We're told in Acts chapter 5 that Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and thus were condemned because the Holy Spirit is holy and personal. And so there is that reference here. But more than that, I want to speak to this. It begs the question as to whether we should expect new revelations today. And there are two reasons for answering no. First, the Holy Spirit was not giving a new revelation here. The Holy Spirit was not adding to the gospel. The Holy Spirit was merely directing the leaders of the church in Antioch as to what to do with the gospel. In other words, what is going on here is what we call a prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's as if the Holy Spirit nudges, gently nudges the leadership of the church here and says, now is the time for the church to embark upon mission. And the Holy Spirit almost certainly, in nudging the people of God, did so through the prophets who were operating and prophesying in the church in Antioch. Now, we don't have prophets today because we have the scriptures the Holy Spirit has inspired these scriptures, and so we read in Ephesians 2.20 that the apostles and the prophets were but the foundation of the church in the New Covenant era. And so now having the Word of God, it is through the Word that the Holy Spirit speaks. And so then, while we don't expect fresh revelations, I want to say that when we walk closely with the Lord, we should expect these promptings of the Holy Spirit as we read the word, as we embarked upon not only speaking to God, but listening to what God has to say to us, that he might lead us, that he might prompt us to follow the direction that he is giving. That does not mean to say that the Holy Spirit adds to the word of God. The Holy Spirit merely guides us consistent with what is in the word of God. Of God. So then, bearing in mind these background issues, we come now to the place of mission in a faithful church. And from the second half of verse 2 through verse 4, notice briefly with me four observations. First of all, in a faithful church, mission is vitality. The Holy Spirit said, The church in Antioch did not develop overnight into ascending church. She needed both uh, maturity, and we'll come to that next week, but she also needed vitality. What is vitality? It is that sense of being alive. It is that vibrancy. And from the church in Antioch, then, note two evidences that a church is spiritually alive. The first is that history, a history, is alive to us. Now, by nature, I've been around the Christian church long enough to know that there are those who are born with a, a, a great love of history. And there are those who are born with a great love of science who can't stand history. We're all sorts of people with different interests. Some are artistic, speaking with Chin Chin the other night. Some are artistic, some are mechanical. Some are into science and technology. Some are into history. But there's a wonderful thing that happens when a person becomes a Christian and they fall in love with the Bible as the word of God. And they listen out for what God has to say to them through the Bible. And one of the things that happens is that they fall in love with history. Because most of the word of God is history. It's the history of our redemption. 
Well, we must remember history and we must apply it. The German philosopher George Friedrich Hegel said, history teaches us that history teaches us nothing. But as Martin Lloyd-Jones has said, that ought not to be the case with a Christian. And so I put it to you in the background here, the church in Antioch was remembering her history and was ready to apply it. Well, what would they have remembered? Well, they would have remembered, first of all, that it was the men of Cyprus and Cyrene who broke their cultural boundaries, who spoke to the Hellenists the the good news of Jesus Christ, and through that the church was founded. So it was because they did, in love, share the good news beyond their own people group that Antioch, the church in Antioch, came into existence at all. She was founded on mission. And also, I put it to you, that they would have remembered the God of Israel. God had not cursed that effort of the men of Cyprus and Cyrene. He'd blessed the initiative. And that blessing was consistent with the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, where a vision had been given to God's people that a day was coming where the gospel would go out to the ends of the earth. And by the time we come to Acts 13, Jesus, Acts 1.8, has already said that when the Spirit comes in power, you are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so what do we learn then? We learn that these believers in Antioch were inspired by history now to become not simply a receiving church, but a sending church. And so may I commend to you as I would commend to myself as a newcomer to this church, the importance of reading up on the history of St. Andrews. We have an exhibition in the church which ought to be visited with praise to God. I think of those who first planted this church, first of all as a preaching station. I thank God for the vision of those of the North London Presbytery who decided there ought to be a witness in this part of the world I stand in awe of those who first came as missionaries, who didn't have fans, who didn't have air conditioning, who didn't have snake repellent, who sweated for the gospel, and through sweat and tears planted this church. That is a living history, may it ever be so. And I am encouraged as I read of John Sung, who was so greatly used in this part of the world, when it came to his deathbed, he confessed to God that he'd been too hard on the missionaries. And many in the world of theology are too hard on the missionaries today. What they gave up in order that local people in different parts of the world could receive the good news of the gospel, and we need to keep that history alive. But the second thing of a vital church is that worship is alive. More immediately, the inspiration to become a sending church arose from the worship and the fasting. That's clear in the verses here. And there are telling lessons that we may take home. First of all, of the importance of worship. How much we miss out on in worship or can miss out on in worship if we are inconsistent in attending the worship. That is not only contrary to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, it is also detrimental to our own well-being. Because we come with expectant minds, expectant hearts, not only to give praise to God, but to receive a blessing from God, to hear from God, to say it was good to be in the house of the Lord today because I not only unburdened my soul of the praise to which God is due, but I receive from him. You see, worship then is not only a one-way communication, it's two-way. We both hear from God, the call to worship, the scripture reading, the ministry of the word, the benediction to come. But we also speak to God. We speak to him in prayer, hymns, confession, our offering. And so here, the spirit, a missionary spirit, determines the time is ripe for this church in Antioch now to send missionaries. So I ask us this question. Do we prepare for worship? Listen, if I was given five dollars every time I heard in, in the 
Uh, United Kingdom, five pounds. United States, five dollars. What's that? 20 ringgit in Malaysia. If I was given that amount of money every time I heard somebody say, I don't get anything out of the ministry of the word. I don't get anything out of the ministry of the word. Eternity will tell how much percentage of that lament is drawn from a refusal to prepare our hearts for worship and to come with expectancy to hear from God. Not only to trot out words to God, but to hear from God. His word entering a cleansed mind through the blood of Jesus, a cleansed heart, a willing will, as we come into the house of God saying, what has God got for me today? Because I have come to glorify God, to worship him, and I have come with every expectation through the gospel of the Lord Jesus that when I adore God, when I worship him, he is going to speak to me. He is going to shape my thinking. He is going to touch my heart. He is going to redirect my will according to his will. It was while they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, have we cleared the channels for worshiping God, for hearing from God? Secondly, in a faithful church, mission is humility. Sad to say, the church isn't always eager to send out its members on mission. There are a number of reasons for that. Nobody likes to see a church shrink by planting another church. Nobody likes to see uh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ go off to a different part of the world. In fact, when Brenda and I left Michigan recently, our own pastor was in tears from the pulpit. Nobody likes the thought of a tither, a faithful tither, giving their tithes elsewhere, their offerings elsewhere. Nobody likes the thought of saying goodbye to loved ones, even though we have the whole scope of eternity to spend together. And so we're not always eager for mission. And so what we find here is the submission of the church in Antioch. Note the Spirit's command. Set apart for me. Well, they didn't turn around and say, well, it doesn't matter, Holy Spirit, what you want. This is what we want. We want a bigger congregation, and giving away our members is not part of the plan. We want a, a bigger budget, and giving away our tithes is not part of the plan. We want rich fellowship because we're in this holy huddle, and we don't want that holy huddle broken up by people going to the far parts of the world. And then again, verse 4, what do you find? They were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And so there is then going on here a threefold submission. First of all, the submission of the leadership. The Holy Spirit is directing them to give up 40% of their leaders. Consider the feelings of Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean. What a weight of responsibility falls on them. We read that it was Barnabas and Saul who were teaching the church for a whole year. And uh, now Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean have to say, well... Okay, huh. a lot falls on us. Five leaders here. We have five elders in St. Andrews, teaching and ruling elders. Supposing as a result of the worship service this morning, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me, elder A, elder B, because I've got work for them to do outside of St. Andrews. You know what the other elders are going to be saying. You know what the congregation is going to be saying. We can't afford this. We can't afford this. But they submitted as leaders to the direction. We pursue congregational maturity precisely that we may be ready for the Holy Spirit to redirect the energies of some of our leaders. Then we notice the submission of the church. The Holy Spirit directs the saints to relinquish their fathers in the faith. Barnabas and Saul had taught them for a whole year. Yet now God wills for them to serve the wider church. So the church has a choice. Are we going to thank God for the ministry that we received for a year? Or are we going to lament the fact that Barnabas and Saul are no longer going to be with us? Notice here. Contrary to what we sometimes find when mission comes into view, 
that God gives to the wider church the best, not the worst. I remember as a young student, we had come to the church where I attended as a student, a man by the name of Omri Jenkins, who's now with the Lord, who was director of the European Missionary Fellowship. And I always remember him saying, as an elder statesman in the faith, as he looked at us students, and he says, the church needs to be ready to give away its best men. But that's not always how we treat the mission field. I remember hearing when I was a young boy of missionaries open up in a care package. And they were astonished to find tea bags in the care package that had already been used. Well, just give the used tea bags to the missionaries. But that's sometimes our view of missions. It's all important what happens here. What happens out there doesn't matter so much. And in fact, when students come out of theological college and some uh, may have a dubious gift to preach, they may bore uh, the pants off people or they cannot organize their, uh, their information and it's uh, troublesome as to whether they can hold a congregation together through the ministry of the word. What do we say? Well, we say, oh, send them off to the mission field. Send them off to the mission field. No, if they can't preach on home soil, they certainly can't preach in a culture that's not their own. So you see the submission of the church. They submit to the Holy Spirit's leading that their best men, their strongest men, be sent away. And then the submission of Barnabas and Saul. The Holy Spirit directs them to leave a place where they've known peace and blessing. Barnabas had come up from Jerusalem, a hostile context. Saul had been run out of Damascus, then out of Jerusalem. You can read of that in Acts 9. And compare Acts 26, 21. And now he's going to the unknown. Why does he go? Well, you see, it's already been prophesied of him that he'll go to the Gentile world. And this is what we read in the third version of his testimony in Acts 26, 16 through 18. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's on the road to Damascus. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this person, purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You see the two sides of that. Go to the Gentiles. So Paul, Saul here, deduces that this directive from the Holy Spirit comports with the commission he's already received, and he goes in the hope that the gospel will come to countless others, and it does. Thirdly, in a faithful church, mission is generosity, verse 3. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off, humbly submitting to the wisdom and the will of God. Simeon, Lucius, and Menaean prepare the church for the departure of Barnabas and Saul. Notice three elements. First of all, the commending. The first time Barnabas and Saul were sent out, it was spontaneous. They heard of the famine going to be affecting the church in Judea. So the disciples gathered together. They gave in accordance to what they have, and they sent Barnabas and Saul off. But this is different. We read that the church fasted again. Not this time to hear from God, but to commend Barnabas and Saul to God in prayer. Notice the end of the missionary journey, which Ashley read earlier. Chapter 14, verses 24 to 26. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. So the worshiping and the fasting here was commending them to the grace of God. They're going out into this dangerous world and they're going with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They commended them to the grace of God. You see, prayer is both the source of a church's vitality but it is also the expression of that vitality. The prayer in the life of the church should become very natural to us. 
If there's one activity in which we all ought to be involved with, it is prayer. We can be a mature congregation, we can do the right things, but unless we are a praying congregation, we will not have the vitality of a church that is spiritually alive. They commended Barnabas and Saul to the Lord. And then we notice the commissioning. This was not a commissioning to apostleship. Barnabas is referred to an apostle in Acts 14 verses 4 and 14 only in a general sense of having been sent out from the church in Antioch because the word apostle comes from the verb apostello, which means to send. As for Saul, he already held the office of an apostle since his conversion. And so his conversion was also his commissioning. The laying on of the hands here then was an identification with the calling of Barnabas and Saul. It's the church coming around these two men, identifying with their work, saying we are with you as you go out. We love you, but we love God more. And we are going to send you out in the name of Jesus Christ, led by the Spirit. But you remember that we are with you in this. We lay our hands upon you. We pray for God's blessing for you. You see, missionaries are not lone rangers. Their sending out is public and it is orderly. But notice also the, commit, the committing at the end of verse 3. They sent, they sent them off. Doubtless it was a moving farewell, but not clinging to Barnabas and Saul. They sent them away. Barnabas and Saul knew that they were loved. But they had been trained. They had trained the saints in Antioch to love God more. Recall the words of Jesus to Mary Magdalene in John 28, 17. She comes to the tomb on the day of resurrection. She's looking for her master. And then she realizes her master and she clings to him. And Jesus says, do not cling to me. I must shortly arise to my father. In other words, love me, worship me, but do not cling to me. And it's the same amongst the people of God. We cling to one another. And sometimes too tightly. Because we want them where we are. But under the direction of the Holy Spirit, there's a place for releasing them, letting them go. They've got to do the will of God. And so I say to us as a church, do we love God enough to say farewell to those whom we love? Parents, do you love your children but less than you love God? Enough to say, I release you to do the will of God. You know, when I moved to America in 1999, I mentioned last week my father was ill with multiple sclerosis for 25 years. And I'd received a call to go to America. And I delayed because I was trying to figure out what matters here, honoring my father and mother and caring for them in their health or taking up this call. And after about three weeks when I was receiving emails saying America is not such a bad place to live, I walked into the bedroom one morning to say, as my father had said to me so often, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. And without even looking at me, he took the cup of tea, thanked me, and then says the words of Jesus. Unless a person hates his father and mother, he cannot, I remember him emphasizing that, he cannot be my disciple. That's what it means to love God more than even your nearest and dearest. And so fourthly and very briefly, in a faithful church mission is strategy. The church doesn't randomly send out people. Understand the nature of the call. Two elements to it. The external call of the church, reflective of God's will, and the internal call within the hearts and minds of Barnabas and Saul. Saul doubtless reasoned that it concurred with his commissioning as an apostle. And so consistently, if God places a call on our lives, it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. The two witnesses in particular are the work of the Holy Spirit in my own heart, showing me my gifting, showing me my sense of calling. But it's an erroneous assessment unless the church recognizes the call as directed by the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, the outworking of the call. 
they set out for Cyprus. That should make your ears prick up. Cyprus again, several plausible reasons to reverse the connection with Cyprus. After all, it was men from Cyprus who brought the gospel to Antioch. It's the giving back of a compliment, so to speak. Or to connect with Barnabas' place of, of origin, because we know from Acts 4, he was uh, born in Cyprus. And then they were heading to Cyprus on the way to Asia. What do I say then? Missionaries are neither randomly sent, nor do they randomly go. There's a method in it. So let me say as we close then this morning that we welcome people from all over the globe. I was reading this week, and I don't like it at all, because I think uh, ratings on the World Wide Web are so unfair, so lacking in accountability and responsibility. And so I, I was reading a review of St. Andrews from a visitor from four years ago or so, saying that they were turned back because of their race. I find that extraordinarily hard to believe. And so let me say it again publicly, that we rejoice in St. Andrews to welcome people from all over the globe. Anybody is welcome to come and to worship in this place. Let it be said publicly and loudly. But the question from this morning's service is this. Are we ready to send out and to support saints in taking the gospel across the globe? Consider three things as I close. First of all, our context. I learned recently that uh, belonging to the Presbyterian Church of Malaysia as a congregation, we only send out 2.5% of the budget to the Presbyterian Church in Malaysia. I'm just learning as I go. And the side effect of that is that mission in the Presbyterian Church in Malaysia largely rests on the individual congregation. And so it is then a question for us. We receive people from all over the globe. Are we sending people all over the globe in the cause of mission? Secondly, our conscience. Are we open to the Spirit's leading? Should he direct us? Should he come through the word and say, set apart, leader X, leader Y, leader Z, for the work that I have called them to do? Would we be sufficiently faithful to do that? And third, our conviction. If Christ died to secure the gospel, and the church dies to self to communicate the gospel, should not you, this morning, if you are yet to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, yet to turn from your sins unto the Lord, should not you run to Christ for the gospel? If Christ died for the gospel, it's so important. If the church is to die to self for the gospel because it's so important, should not you, if you are yet to profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, come running to Christ for the gospel? Well, help us, Lord, to be a faithful church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. There's so much in it, and we've run through it so quickly. But we thank you that your spirit is alive and personal and well able to take hold of this word and apply it to our minds and hearts. Help us to walk so closely to you as your people that we are prompted by the Holy Spirit, nudged to do your will day by day. But Father, we also pray for any who as of yet do not have faith in Jesus Christ, have not turned from their sins unto you, that even this moment you would bring them from death to life and grant them, O God, abundant entrance into your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. So follow your word with your blessing, we pray, and we'll give you the glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, the one and only head of the church. And all God's people say, Amen.